Okay, I guess we'll get started. So I'll introduce myself first. My name is Erfan. I'm one of the PGY3s in the Royal College program. My uh, supervisor was Samir Mall. He was very, very helpful in uh, setting this up. Uh, he's on the call, so hopefully he'll correct all the mistakes that I make today. Uh, the topic today is hemorrhage management in trauma. Uh, I chose this because I had a, quite an exciting trauma rotation. I was on it right around the time that the large building collapse happened in Code Orange. And so that got me in, into the literature and excited about this topic. So first I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Samir Mall. He was instrumental in setting this up. Uh, Dr. Kelly Voigt uh, helped me lots as well. Uh, she was a good mentor during that trauma rotation and sent me some resources. Dr. Rob Leeper as well, uh, he helped me with the literature on uh, Reboa, which we'll be talking about at the end of the talk, as well as Dr. Ziad Sal from the hematology department. Uh, he was very helpful in talking about viscoelastic assays um, that we'll be talking about as well. So the outline for my talk today is to start sort of in a stepwise approach. We're gonna start with the basics, go through current management, and then talk about some future directions and some of the more cutting edge, exciting stuff in uh, hemorrhage management and trauma. So we'll start with the statistics and background, then move on to basic concepts and physiology. And I, I will discuss something a bit more advanced in that topic uh, with acute traumatic coagulopathy. It's a new concept that I was actually not familiar with as well until I got into the literature. And then move on to what we currently do, which will be very recognizable to everyone, ATLS, MTPs, uh, blood ratios we use, the use of TXA and the literature behind that, as well as a concept called damage control, control resuscitation, which is, is uh, honestly can be a talk into a, in and of itself, but I, I will briefly mention it. And then we'll talk about viscoelastic assays, Rotem and TEG, uh, which I'll explain once we get there, uh, vasopressin use in trauma, as well as Reboa. So we'll start the day off with a case. Uh, so this is the Vic special, certainly at this time of year, 30 year old male, MVC rollover at highway speeds, patients presenting to the emergency department uh, with the following vital signs, a heart rate of 130, a rest rate of 35, a blood pressure of 85 over 55, pulse ox of 96% on 100% uh, by face mask, as well as a temperature of 33 degrees. So going through our primary survey, um, airway is unremarkable, breathing is unremarkable as well. Patient does have a seatbelt sign as well as findings of an unstable pelvis. They're GCS 13, so slightly confused but moving all their limbs. And on exposure, they're of course hypothermic as we can see in their vital signs. Uh, of note, they're in their adjuncts, their fast is negative. So big things that jump out here. This patient is unstable, of course. I don't think anyone would refute that. Uh, they're in shock, and first thing in shock that we think of is hemorrhagic shock, always. Blood, blood, blood is, is always the number one answer in this, okay? We'll come back to this case a few times throughout the presentation to try and sort of uh, put things into perspective as I'm presenting the interventions that we can do for this patient. So we'll start with the background of trauma. Uh, it is a huge burden on uh, life all across the world. So the WHO, every few years, they come up with a very, very large epidemiologic study with, uh, that involves hundreds of countries, and they're able to find what is you know, causing the most suffering to humanity. And trauma in the young age groups is always number one. Uh, in the less than 10 years old, and so the infant neonate, it's a little bit different, a lot of infectious disease. However, from 10 to 24, Road injuries are number one. Uh, unfortunately, and very sadly, self-harm is number three and violence is number five. So in the top 10, three of those, three of the losses of life and losses of years is trauma related. Similar to age 24 to 49, again, road injuries are number one. Uh, so me and lots of other people, I'm sure are very excited for self-driving cars. We'll see what that impact that has. Uh, self-harm is, and violence are also in the top 20 for that age group. So in, amazingly, uh, in that same study that the WHO had done back in 2010, they had crunched some other numbers to ass assess for the amount of disability adjusted life years that are lost, which is a metric to see how much, uh, like if it, there's a severe morbidity that's involved or immortality, they take the time at which that happened and then subtract it from the average lifespan. 
and they account all those life years lost. And trauma accounted for 11.2% of that worldwide with all other diseases combined. Going down right into trauma, the, the most common cause of death in trauma is hemorrhage at uh, 35%. It's reported up to 40, close to 50% in some studies. Uh, then big number two is traumatic brain injury, which we won't talk uh, touch upon, but this is the number one killer. And so having an approach to it and understanding what, why we do what we do is very important. 50% uh, of trauma of uh, uh, hemorrhage deaths do occur before seeking care. So um, as we'll go to the next slide, which is something we all learned in ATLS, there's that trimodal distribution of death and trauma. And there's certain key points that we can get, you know, provide interventions that will have significant um, improvements in mor morbidity and mortality. So we have that immediate death curve. Certainly the TBI population will probably fall into that. There's a significant hemorrhage population that will fall into that. Uh, you know, with good pre-hospital care, uh, with good protocolized emergency department care, we may be able to intervene on those. Certainly in the early death period, that's our bread and butter. And we'll talk about how we can help these people. So we'll jump into the basic physiology of hemorrhage. We're all familiar with this graph. I won't go through it step-by-step, step, but it is a graph outlining the coagulation cascade. Very, very key in our understanding of how to manage trauma. I will specifically talk about very, a very important adjunct, uh, which is calcium. Uh, it is very often overlooked and it is very, very important. And as you can see on the slide here, it, it is involved in multiple segments of the coagulation cascade. So it activates factor two, factor seven, factor nine, factor 10, also has activity on protein CNS. It is a significant ionotrope as well. So um, although trauma is a hemorrhagic shock or hypovolemic shock, it's gonna help with that cardio cardiogenic component as well as things are sort of falling off the rails. It also is very important in not only the coagulation cascade, but afterwards in the stabilization of platelets and thrombus. An interesting uh, retrospective chart review done by Ian Carey et al. in 2016. Uh, they took a look at all of their patients receiving massive transfusions, and they found that 97.4 of them fell into the hypocalcemic category, with 71% of them being in the severe hypocalcemic category. So um, just for the medical students there, when we do the massive transfusion in the blood products, we have a compound called citrate, and that will chelate your calcium and iatrogenically bring it down. And so although giving blood is, is the answer, as we'll discuss, uh, you can sometimes shoot yourself in the foot if you're not proactive about it. It's almost the, these findings are almost to the point that uh, major trauma centers across the world, so, uh, lots of protocols, uh, such as the code red protocol that we'll talk to talk about from the UK recommends prophylactically giving calcium or very upfront giving calcium, not reactively to your assays that are coming back. Next, we'll go into the lethal triad of trauma. Again, this is ATLS. Um, this is an ATLS topic that we that we go over. So we have three components to it. We have hypothermia, coagulopathy, and metabolic acidosis. It, the lethal triad goes through this uh, sort of vicious cycle that once the patient is in this death spiral, it's very difficult to get them out. What I will talk about specifically here is the coagulopathic component in trauma. Uh, we're all very familiar with the dilutional coagulopathy, which we can see on this, this little image on the side. We always think of if we give too, many flu too much fluids, we're gonna dilute out our, uh, our clotting factors and that's what's gonna cause us to become coagulopathic. However, there's more to it than that. There's actually a concept called acute traumatic coagulopathy, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And it's something very important to recognize because it happens very early in trauma. So this was actually first starting to be recognized around 20 years ago. And since then, lots, lots of literature has supported it. The first study that started mentioning this is a study by Brohi et al. It was a retrospective chart review in all their trauma patients. And they had a suspicion that there was more, go more going on uh, in the, their coagulop coagulopathic patients than just the fluids they were giving. They noticed uh, they, they had a study of uh, 1,088 patients. They noticed that 24% of the patients had an acute coagulopathy. And when they reviewed it and correlated it to the fluid volume they received, they found that there was no relation whatsoever. And it was only related to their injury severity. 
So since then, like I said, there's been lots of advancement. There's a very, very good review article by Kushimoto et al, 2017, in the Journal of Intensive Care, which talks about it and also outlines the, the proposed mechanism. So the idea is uh, you get a tissue hyperperfusion from the shock or from the, the endothelial injury. That causes, causes a consumption of all your coagulation factors. You go into a hypocoagulable state and you get a significant increase in your fibrogenolysis. So again, shooting yourself in the foot and that's proposed to be from overactive protein C. Lots of people think that this is just run of the mill DIC, but studies have shown that this is, uh, DIC is the concept of hypercoagulability as well as hypocoagulability. In acute traumatic coagulopathy, it's very much in the hypocoagulable state. You don't see the fibrin deposition necessarily that you see in, in, in DIC related to other pathologies. So we're gonna go over the current management now of uh, how we manage trauma. This is gonna be very, very familiar to everyone. So we'll go through a brief history of transfusion. It's actually quite interesting. I, I really enjoyed learning about this uh, through some of the research I was doing. So the first documented uh, transfusion ever done was sheep to human. And it was actually for a young boy who was being bloodlet too much for whatever disease he had. And so they realized he was now anemic and needing blood. And for whatever reason, they chose a sheep to do a transfusion. Fast forward a few years, the first successful, well, not a few years, several, several decades, uh, first successful human to human transfusion was performed. And this was actually in an obstetric patient for postpartum hemorrhage. And uh, the husband was the one that gave whole blood to the, to the wife uh, at the direct discretion of the obstetrician. Luckily, they didn't have a transfusion reaction, but at the time they did not know about any of those things. Um, and so a few case reports or a case series was published by that obstetrician. Interestingly enough, blood was actually transfused before saline ever was. So in 1830s, the first documented use of saline and it was used for watery diarrhea or cholera. People got a bit more creative afterwards. In 1870, they started using, trying to use milk. Uh, that obviously didn't go well and was abandoned shortly thereafter. It's not until the 1880s that we see saline become a very major IV fluid uh, and it becomes first line for absolutely everything. The blood transfusion was still very much in its infancy and it's not tw until 20 years later that uh, blood types were discovered. So ABO blood types uh, and several years after that before the subtypes and the RH groups were discovered. Uh, as is in a lot of things, uh, war seems to be a big driver in trauma knowledge and trauma research. And it's not until World War I that we see the widespread use of blood in trauma. Uh, they start using um, people that are matched buddies, buddy matching for whole blood transfusion. They start having reservoirs in the areas that the medics are in to start giving blood. Throughout the, ninth, throughout the 1900s to the 2000s, though, I would say, uh, going through the literature, there was lots of use of crystalloids still for uh, trauma, and it's not until very recently, and some studies that have shown, which we'll go over, that crystalloids are harmful in trauma before blood becomes the major component. And so a big study that uh, had a huge impact on what we do and the recommendations of ATLS was a study by Lay et al in 2011 in the Journal of Trauma. It was a prospective single center study, uh, 3,037 patients were used, were, were, um, were studied. And their goal was to determine the crystalloid volume at which the, there, it is an independent risk factor for mortality. And um, surprisingly, it was actually quite low. So any patient that was in an, hypovolemic shock from hemorrhage who received greater than 1.5 liters of crystalloid, this was correlated with an independent risk factor for mortality. And so moving to ATLS, previous to the 2018 edition of ATLS, it was a sort of a blanket requirement or a blanket recommendation that every patient receive one to two liters of crystalloid before they were determined to be needing blood. Um, and your oral exams and everything we had to do, we had to mention this even though the literature was not necessarily supporting this. In the 10th edition, uh, due to that study, as well as a few others, now they recommend restrict to only one liter of crystalloid in your initial assessment. And they also recommend the early use of blood products, which is certainly more in keeping with the times 
Moving a bit more advanced on some of the recommendations or things that we could improve on ATLS uh, that I'll quickly touch on before moving forward is uh, an interesting paper that was published by uh, two docs out of the Toronto of St. Mike's, uh, Dr. Petrosoniak and Hicks. Uh, so not only did they do they talk about um, you know the, the blood requirements, which is sort of standard of practice now, they also talk about resuscitation resequenced in that um, because a uh, because ATLS recommends things in such an algorithmic way, that's that's okay for the basic provider, but for certainly for the higher level provider, we need to think more pragmatically about the our patient and resequence things. So similar to how ACLS has gone with the CAB approach, uh, um, prioritizing circulation over airway, they've also recommended this. Uh, so standard ATLS that was always mentioned to go right for the airway, intubate, and then go down the Bs and Cs uh, in a stepwise fashion. They recommend going uh, for the airway only in, in case there's an imminent threat, such as uh, dangerous hypoxia or dynamic airway from an inhalational injury or an obstruction. And then uh, quickly moving on to focusing on shock, which is what's going to be killing your patient in, in, uh, in trauma. A hemorrhagic shock being the number one killer. And so looking for things like shock index, base deficit, um, and things like that uh, to guide your resuscitation before circling back to do things. Uh, it's a good paper. I recommend any sort of higher level provider, senior residents read. Uh, that this sort of paper can be boiled down to that same, to that little uh, motto that we always hear, certainly that we always say, are saying in oral exams of resuscitate before you intubate. So we can move on back to hemorrhage. So why blood? I mean, the bottom line, it's very simple. You should be replacing what you're losing. Uh, there's a reason we have blood. It's, it's physiologically sound. It does all our processes. Saline doesn't provide, you know, uh, oxygen carrying capacity or anything of that nature. So how do we give blood? Uh, in the last several decades, the concept of massive transfusion has been brought uh, and established in all the large hospitals. Massive transfusion is defined in various ways. Uh, there's really no consensus. Certainly the most common definition I've heard uh, and I always put on my exams is 10 units of packed red blood cells in 24 hours uh, is deemed as a massive transfusion. There's other definitions of replacement of a person's entire blood volume in 24 hours. Uh, some people say uh, greater than four units in one hour. Here is where what uh, LHSC's massive transfusion protocol looks like. Um, I'm sure we've all seen it run uh, either on the floor or in the units or certainly in the trauma bay. I won't go through the whole thing, but I will point out that what our massive transfusion protocol uses is a one to one to one ratio that we'll talk about. Uh, when I talk about one to one to one, I'm talking about packed red blood cells to platelets to plasma. So as we can see in the middle here, one dose of platelets. So it's a pooled dose of platelets, which is important to note for the juniors. So that it comes out to four, the equivalent of four units. So the ratio comes out to one to one to one. That's our massive transfusion protocol. Um, I will talk about how some other st different systems do it. Uh, Samir can probably talk about this at the end of our talk, but uh, the massive transfusion protocol has very much been fully connected into this very comprehensive, um, fully integrated system of a call, called a code red. And so the code red is not simply just activating blood products, but it uh, vertically integrates all the systems involved in a hemorrhaging patient, in a traumatic hemorrhaging patient. So there's a pre-hospital uh, activation. Uh, certainly their pre-hospital system is a bit different than ours with docs in the field, but pre-hospital activation, pre-hospital blood products, uh, activation of blood products in the ER to be ready as they arrive, uh, immediate activation of the surgical, uh, the th surgical theater for patients to be transferred there directly. Um, they also have other other, other things like Rotem and Teg that we'll talk about. But basically, a lot of the research that we're going to talk about as far as improving mortality, we're talking about a few percent here and there. Amazingly, there's a study uh, that was published when, that when they reviewed their, uh, their mortality rates in traumatic hemorrhage in the UK, 
before they had this comprehensive code red system and after, and they were able to improve mortality in these traumatic hemorrhage patients from 57 to 26%, which is astronomical. Like I, I wasn't able to see their specific numbers to see, is there a mistake or something, but this is a huge, huge impact on mortality and not necessarily from different delivery of medical care, but just rapid delivery of that care because things are so protocolized. Certainly at LHSC in the three years I've been here, I, I can say that there's um, gaps in that protocolization. There's significant delays between one step to the next. Lots of times there is difficulty in um, understanding what's the pre-hospital team is seeing or doing or what's going on. Uh, so there's definitely room for improvement there. Next issue, we need to really significantly reduce delays. So I've seen several times where there's long delays for x-ray to get there. There's delays for the TTL to activate the trauma surgeon, who only the trauma surgeon is allowed to activate the OR. So the patient is sitting in the recess bay 25 minutes bleeding, uh, which will, of course, have impact their mortality. So having some sort of streamlined system at LHSC would be of great benefit. And we can have this discussion at the end of the talk. So going to back to the one to one to one ratio. So where does that come from? Uh, the grand, one of the sort of grandfathers of transfusion medicine, he, he actually said that he, he made it up. So he just thought to himself, what do the, what do the military people do? Uh, they give whole blood. What is the closest equivalent to whole blood? it would be to give things into one to one to one ratio. So that was recommended for a long time without actually that much evidence. The proper trial in 2015 came out, uh, which looked at specifically this question. So what was the effectiveness of giving one to one to one versus one to one to two uh, in, in, for hemorrhage in severe trauma? So their, their measures that they looked at, their primary outcome was uh, the 24 hour mortality as well as 30 day mortality. So looking at uh, two of the modes in the trimodal distribution, as well as their secondary outcomes, looking for time to hemostasis, the amount of blood used, the complications that happen, the need for surgery, uh, and the functional status of these patients. So it was a very well done trial. Uh, it was an RCT. Unfortunately, of course, it wasn't blinded because people could count the number of bags of products these patients were using. There was a very uh, good sample size calculation done. So they used, uh, they determined that they needed 680 patients to detect a 10% difference in 24 hour mortality, as well as a 12% difference in 30 day mortality. We'll go back to that, but that seems like a little bit ambitious, especially when I was mentioning before, mortality differences in, in trauma, they're gonna be only a few percent. So it's gonna be difficult to find actual differences but they, they uh, for whatever reason, decided to do this 10 to 12% cutoff. The control group was the one-to-one-to-two -one -to -two group and the intervention group was the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one group. Here's the, uh, um, a table of their outcomes. We'll just summarize them here. So the overall results, their primary outcome, bottom line, there was no significant difference. So there was no difference in mortality at the 24 hour mark or the 30 day mark. I have posted the percentages here. So you can see there was a trend towards a preference to the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one group uh, in both 24 hours and 30 days. However, it did not meet that 10 or 12% criteria for it to be significant based on their sample size. Moving to their secondary outcomes, there was also no significant difference in any of those um, outcomes. When they did do their subgroup analysis or the post hoc analysis, they did find some significant findings. Uh, so the one to one to one group achieved hemostasis in a higher percentage. There was also less death from exsanguination uh, from the one to one to one group or in the one to one to one group at 9.2% and 14%. And these were deemed to be significant. However, these were not pre prescribed outcomes. So overall, just to summarize, it was a negative study, yes. However, there's question whether it was actually underpowered and there was going to be uh, significant findings. We will never know until another study is done. Uh, and also the post hoc, uh, the post hoc or subgroup analyses, they're interesting. And again, they point towards a trend to favor one to one to one, but it shouldn't affect your practice and, um, you know, take of it what you will, basically. Next, we'll move on to tranexamic acid. So, this is a life-saving medication. It's certainly on the list of must-have medications across the world. 
The way it works uh, at the end stage of the coagulation cascade, we have fibrin formation to form clot and tranexamic acid blocks plasminogen from becoming plasmin and what blocks the, um, the clot from being broken down. Here's the chemical structure of tranexamic acid. So we'll quickly talk about the CRASH-2 trial. It is a landmark trial. I'm sure lots of people have reviewed this uh, ad nauseum in Journal Club, so I won't spend too much time on it. But uh, it was a huge study, like very impressive that they were able to pull this off. Their question was, does TXA affect mortality, the incidence of occlusive events, uh, or the amount of blood transfused? Their primary outcome was in-hospital mortality at four weeks. Their secondary outcomes were uh, looking for thrombotic events, the amount of blood products used, and the functional status of these patients. It was an enormous study, like I mentioned, 274 hospitals across 40 countries. It was well done in that it was blinded. They used normal saline in one group and tranexamic acid in the other group. And they had a sample size of two, over 20,000 patients. So um, very impressive. Summary of their findings, there was a significant difference in, uh, in mortality in the TXA group. So 14.5% and 16%. So again, only a few percentage points like we mentioned, but um, a positive result nonetheless, which is exciting. Even more interesting, they found no difference in the rate of thrombotic events. So if you think that tranexamic acid blocks breakdown of clots and our traumatic patients are bedridden enough post-trauma, Interestingly enough, there was no difference found in this study uh, for DVTs and PEs. Moving on to another study, smaller size, uh, but also impactful was the MATTERS trial. This was done by the US Army. Uh, they, their question was in military combat injuries, what effect does TXA have on mortality, blood product uses and thrombotic outcomes? Uh, this was published around the similar time to the CRASH-2 trial. Their primary outcome was mortality at 24 hours, 48 hours, and, and in-hospital mortality. And again, their secondary outcome was blood product used and the rates of DVT and PE. It was single center. It was done in, uh, in Afghanistan during the war. And uh, their cutoff to start giving TXA was around the one uh, unit of blood mark. There was significant changes during the the time that this study was rolling out. Uh, like I said, it was it published around a similar time to the CRASH-2 trial. And so certainly practice variations could have happened where the docs in the um, surgical center would have been aware of the findings of CRASH-2 and may have changed their practice throughout, um, throughout the time, time period of the study. And as you can see, the control group and the intervention group are significantly different in the number of patients they have uh, probably because of this. Their primary outcomes uh, at the 24 hour mortality, they did not find a difference. However, they found significant differences in the 48 hour mortality as well as the in-hospital mortality rate. Uh, so 11 and 17% versus 18 and 23%. Uh, another thing that's important to note, of course, this is, was during, this is a war um, or a military study. And therefore, there's going to be a higher proportion of penetrating trauma. So it seems like TXA works for the penetrating trauma, as well as the CRASH-2 trial would have been in civilian hospitals all across the world. And as we talked about at the beginning, uh, significant burden is MVCs, which would be blunt trauma. So TXA seems to work in both populations, which is great. This study, though, uh, the MATTER study, in their secondary outcomes, they uh, did find that the TXA group received more blood products. Uh, that's probably from them living longer, from giving, getting TXA. If you're going to live longer and continue to bleed, you're going to get more blood products, so unsurprising. Uh, but they did find a positive correlation with PEs and DVTs in the TXA group. So CRASH-2 didn't find the DVT-PE issue. Matters did. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's the jury sort of still out there. These studies, as well as a couple other smaller studies, all culminated into the Cochrane review that I have here. So TXA safely reduces mortality in trauma patients with bleeding without increasing the risk of adverse events. So they, they deemed that the DVTPE uh, was not necessarily um, a significant finding in matters when it was pooled with the rest of the data. Their recommendations are TXA should be given ASAP within three hours of injury, certainly what we do. I'm gonna spend one slide on this. This again is something that could be an entire talk into of itself. 
uh, well, well, we can talk, uh, I'll, I'll address the questions at the end. Sorry, guys. Uh, so damage control resuscitation. Uh, this, it's a sort of a three-pronged approach to the hemorrhaging and trauma traumatic patient. I'm just going to talk about it, briefly mention it, uh, but definitely read up about it because this is something that will probably come up in conferences in the future, perhaps maybe even a future grand rounds is something that someone could do it on. So the first component is hemostatic resuscitation, which we're talking about here, basically. It's uh, evidence-based hemostatic resuscitation. So controlling the source, using compression, et cetera, uh, giving a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one transfusion, giving TXA, giving calcium, and doing all the things that ATLS mentions. The second concept, which is uh, something that's a bit newer uh, that people are talking about, is the concept of permissive hypotension. So this is, uh, again, it's not necessarily that we don't have the great, greatest evidence for it. We have some animal model evidence as well as some uh, evidence in a small study with penetrating trauma, not much in blunt trauma, uh, as well as some un small unblinded studies. However, the, the idea is if a patient is slowing down their hemorrhage, if you give them more preload by giving them more crystalloid or more blood, you're going to increase their preload and increase their bleeding. So at what point do you want to strike that balance of they're no longer, they're not bleeding as much anymore. We're sort of safe in this little, in this area and leave it at that. Um, that that's sort of the concept behind don't bust the clot. And so in these, in these scenarios, the goal is to keep their blood pressure around 90 uh, with a map of 50 to 60. Uh, certainly the, con the, the groups that you don't want to use this in is in the TBI population because they require much higher maps in order to keep their cerebral perfusion up. The third component of damage control resuscitation is uh, damage control surgery. So uh, this is basically starting the resuscitation, stopping immediate source of bleeding, doing the hemostatic resuscitation. And as you have that permissive hypotension, going to the OR to stop immediate sources of bleeding. So whether that's packing the abdomen, uh, doing a splenectomy or or whatever, but it's not definitive repair. You're not going to sit there and repair every single loop of bowel. Uh, you're just going to pack the abdomen, stop the immediate bleeding, and bring them back to the ICU to continue the hemostatic resuscitation, and then later delaying definitive repair to 24 to 36 hours later. So next we'll move on to the newer concepts, uh, certainly not something we do here at Vic, but something that they are doing at the large centers. So the concepts of real time or point of care coagulation testing. So this is a, the broad umbrella term is viscoelastic hemostatic assays. And the two companies or the two modalities that you can do it on is Rotem and TEG. How does it work? So this is new to me as I was reading it. Basically these assays work very similarly. You take a cup of blood, you put it into a sensor. This sensor either spins. So TEG, the sensor spins. And in Rotem, the cup spins. But basically you have a cup of blood that's in a sensor. And as it's spinning over time, the, the blood will start coagulating and the sensor will sense an amount of resistance. That resistance is then input into a computer, analysis is done and a graph is presented, which then helps us you know, give interventions based on their findings. What is the differences between the two? We talked about uh, TEG is the, where the spinster spins, the, uh, sorry, the uh, sensor spins. TEG was also invented first around the 1940s. There's also different nomenclature. Um, this is mostly due to, you know, uh, different, the com different companies running these things. And also Rotem has specific assays where this concept of the spinning cup and the sensor is happening in multiple little assays. And in each assay, they actually add a small reagent to try and tease out each specific um, component of coagulation. So for example, they have uh, an assay called heptem. If there's a patient that's in the OR and has a heparin assay running, they put a heparinase assay. So they eliminate heparin from it. And then they're able to test. And if there's any underlying coagulopathy within that similar thing they can do and, and inhibit platelets. So take platelets out of the equation and see what's going on underneath it all. Here is the, an example of a graph that these assays spit out. Uh, so we'll talk about Rotem because it's used mostly in North America. 
So uh, they have the concept of clotting time and hopefully you guys can see my mouse, but clotting time is when you first take the cup, put it in the sensor, how much time does it take until this dot line right here? How much time does it take before the sensor starts feeling any resistance? So that's the time to first clot. Next, we have the clot formation time. And that's just a fancy way of saying how much time does it take for the clot to reach a specific strength? And that's just like a, a, a constant strength that they've established. They describe it as 20 millimeters. The alpha angle or this angle right here is the, again, also a, a component of how fast does it take for the clot to reach that strength. The maximal clot, um, the maximal clot firmness, as we can see here, is at what point is the clot the strongest and how strong is that clot at that point? And then the lysis at 30 minutes is as the, as the sample is in there at 30 minutes time, how much of that clot is broken down? And each of these uh, findings or each of these um, variables is something we can intervene on with specific products. So here's a good picture I found online about if you find an abnormality in each section of the Rotem or TEG assay, this is the specific treatment that you should give. So if your clotting time is long, you give FFP. If your alpha angle or your maximal um, clot firmness is, is abnormal, you give these products. And if you find at 30 minutes or so, there's too much clot breakdown or the lysis at 30 minutes is too high, you give TXA. So it doesn't make a difference. So right now we use uh, INR, PTT, fibrinogen, uh, at, and it, you know, it takes a while to come back. Just last year in 2020, they had a large study that came out that compared VHAs or Rotem and TEG to uh, conventional tests. Their primary outcome that they wanted to look at was proportion of patients alive and free of massive transfusion at 24 hours. Uh, the secondary was to see if there's any significant difference in all ca cause mortality and total blood products used. It was a multi-center RCT, 411 patients were included. Inclu they included every single patient that was receiving MTP. Their groups were the Rotem and TEG, sorry, the intervention was the Rotem and TEG and the control was the, the conventional tests. So similar to what we use. It was an overall negative study, uh, bottom line. So they found no difference in mortality, no difference in the need for massive transfusion. Uh, this was at the 24 hour mark. They found also no difference in the volume of blood products used. Again, similar to one of the old other studies we looked at, they did do a subgroup analysis and found that the 20 to eight day mortality was lower in the severe TBI group. So, you know, subgroup within a subgroup. So certainly not something that we should hang our hats on and that needs further study, but a signal that they found. ITactic was published in 2020. This, uh, this uh, Cochrane review was published even before that. Uh, and so ITactic basically reverberates what this Cochrane review stated. So in 2017, it was uh, published. They looked at 17 studies with a total of 1,493 patients. Most of these studies were in cardiac surgery uh, and most of the literature for VHAs is in cardiac surgery and transplant surgery uh, with fewer in trauma, iTactic being the biggest and newest one. Their overall findings were that uh, VHAs may reduce the need for blood product usage. Uh, this was seen again, mostly in cardiac surgery where the blood product usage was used, was used less uh, and may improve morbidity in patients with bleeding, but further studies needed are needed for TEG and Rotem guided transfusion in acute settings. So trauma being an acute setting. Interestingly enough, uh, the Canadian government has actually put out a review specifically on this. So they have the CAD, which I didn't know about, but it's the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies and Health. Uh, they're basically a group uh, that's connected with uh, Health Canada that puts out um, reviews on specific topics and reviews the evidence behind them. So their specific question was TEG and Rotem and trauma. It was a review to look at the clinical efficacy the cost and what does the evidence-based guidelines say? So they looked at three systemic reviews, uh, 71 individual studies involved in them. Again, lots of them related to um, cardiac surgery and things of that nature. Uh, they tried to, they did try to focus in on trauma since that was their specific question they're looking at. They looked at one economic evaluation to assess whether it was a cost-effective tool. And uh, they looked at the UK 
guidelines on Teg and Rotem because they're the sort of one of the major players that uses these assays. Their findings were that it's, it's unclear clinical effectiveness wise. There's not enough high quality studies. Uh, the studies that are, are out there are negative studies such as iTactic that we reviewed. So tough to say whether it's actually effective. Cost effectiveness, interestingly enough, it actually is cost saving versus conventional labs. So approximately 688 pounds were saved in a British study per patient. However, if something is cost effective, you would, you know, you also want it to be clinically effective before you start sinking money into the system, et cetera. Finally, what did the uh, evidence-based guidelines say? So the, even the UK says they cannot recommend VHA over current management and trauma currently uh, based on the available evidence, which is not, not very much. So talking to Dr. Ziad Sol from hematology, I want to ask specifically about LHSC, where we're at. You know, we're a tertiary care center with a large catch basin. We should have all the fancy gadgets and the cutting edge tools. So how come we don't have it? Interestingly enough, we actually have a Rotem machine at UH. Uh, it was used for a prior research study. Um, however, since the research study has finished, there's no more quality assurance and like maintenance of this machine. So it's actually not in use. It's just sitting at UH currently. There's several barriers that we discussed. Certainly cost is one of them. A unit itself doesn't necessarily cost that much. And looking through the literature, I could find a quote of 80 to $100,000 for a unit. But where they get you is, is with the contracts. So the quality assurance that invo is involved in this, you need specific people that are trained to upkeep these machines. And a lot of the people, the companies that give you these machines, they make you have to have a mandatory contract in order to uh, keep coming yearly to keep it up. So, and that's how they get the money. So there's a lot of money in that. The other big issues with LHSC is where do you keep it? Do you keep it at UH? That's where cardiovascular surgery is. That's where transplant surgery is. Certainly that's where most of the literature and VHAs are, where it is actually supported and improves, uh, improves some morbidity as well as reduces blood usage. But then at Vic, the trauma team, the trauma service and the vascular service would feel, you know, be the little brother. So where do you keep it? Also the issue is who will be the supervising department? Is it gonna go under hematology? Is it under laboratory medicine? Is it under the point of care testing department? So who will be sort of the, the head that keeps run, that runs it? Really, the bottom line is uh, there's lots of talk surrounding Rotem and Teg. Uh, there's lots of interest, certainly. Maybe the literature doesn't support it as much, but you know, the consensus from a lot of the interviews that I could listen of, even the people that wrote iTactic, was that this is a technology that will be the future. It will have a use. Um, it's a matter of time before you have like significant studies that will then start uh, changing guidelines. So it's gonna, it will come in the future. It just will require multidisciplinary collaboration and discussion at LHSC as to where we're gonna have it and who's gonna be the head. So going back to our case, let's say we did all those things we talked about. We did damage control resuscitation. We did, we gave calcium, we gave TXA, we gave the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one transfusion, hemostatic resuscitation, excellent. Let's say this case, we're actually now at a peripheral hospital. And uh, we've done everything we can basically. And we've given all the blood we have in the department. What are our next options? We already know that blood, that um, giving too much crystalloid is bad and will kill our patient. What can we do? Interestingly, there was actually a study that came out recently it was called the AVERT trial. So can we give pressors in trauma? Uh, certainly the classic teaching in ATLS is to avoid pressors like epi and norepinephrine because they will increase your afterload and your heart doesn't have much to pump out anyways. And so the AVERT trial, they looked at vasopressin specifically for use in trauma and hemorrhagic shock. So the proposed mechanism for vasopressin uh, is like uh, physiologically possible, physiologically plausible, sorry, was to correct vasoplegia, improve platelet function and redistribution of blood from the peripheries to the central organs that we need into our brain. Their question was, does vasopressin reduce the volume of blood products used uh, in hemorrhagic shock. So the primary outcome they looked at was volume of blood products used at 48 hours, as well as the volume of crystalloid mortality and adverse events. So in, importantly, they were using vasopressin for these outcomes and not to correct blood pressure. So they were giving lower dose vas vasopressin. They called 
it basically giving physiologic levels of vasopressin because these patients are now vasopressin deplete because of their shock state. So it was a single center RCT, it was blinded. They had 101 patients. It was mostly penetrating trauma, so maybe not generalizable yet, but uh, interesting nonetheless. That's why we're reviewing it. So they gave four units of vasopressin bolus as well as 0.04 units per, mil per minute. Uh, there, they compared it to normal saline. Their results, there was a significant finding in reduced need for blood uh, products. There was no difference in the amount of packed red blood cells they used, but there was a significant difference in the fresh frozen plasma, platelets, and cryoprecipitate they used. So there was 1.7 units to three units. In their secondary outcomes, there was no second significant differences. And interestingly enough, there was a signal towards lower DVTs in the intervention group. I'm not exactly sure as to why that is, uh, but that was a finding that they had and they decided to mention it. So I wouldn't be giving people vasopressin yet for DVT prophylaxis, but an interesting finding. So bottom line on this, uh, so it may be beneficial. Certainly we need larger studies. Certainly we need more studies, but if I was to reach for a presser in a traumatic situation, I think I would be using vasopressin, although it may be sort of off label use based on the, the way they were using it here. Um, the bottom line shouldn't change your routine management. You should still give blood products, of course, first line, uh, like we have been mentioning. So again, going back to the case, I'm trying to rush so that we have enough time for discussion. Our patient, again, uh, a reminder, he's in hemorrhagic shock. We've done everything we can. We've given him vasopressin now. We've given him, we warmed him calcium, MTP, TX, everything. What can we do next? So as a reminder, his specific injury was an unstable pelvis. So what are our options here at LHSC and what has been done in the past for these specific type of injuries? So lastly, we'll jump into Roboa. Uh, so the sexy new sort of topic that's been going, that's been talked about a lot in the last few years. So Roboa stands for, for the, for the medical students that don't know, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. It was first described in 1954. All cases that were described at that time were unsuccessful. Uh, and there's been a resurgence in the last two decades. And the huge boom was uh, in 2014, the London HEMS in the UK, their pre-hospital service, a doctor was successful in putting in a Reboa at the roadside. Uh, and this patient had major pelvic injury from a fall and they actually were discharged from hospital with normal neurologic outcome, which is pretty surprising. Uh, just for the medical students, if you guys can see my mouse, the way it works is you cannulate the femoral artery here at the uh, groin. You then pass a balloon catheter up the aorta and you're able to blow it up and occlude all distal blood flow from that area. There's three, there's three zones in the aorta. There's two areas that we deploy it. One is in the zone one, so higher up between the subclavian and celiac. That's almost, you can think of it as a non-invasive uh, aortic clamping or, or um, you know, if someone was to do a, a thoracotomy and clamp the aorta, that's sort of where they would do it. And the second area is zone three. So between the, below the renal arteries and the iliacs in this area. And that would be what we'd use for pelvic injury, like, like in our case right here. Uh, going back to the slide, so Reboa, there are significant complications related to it. So a, a um, review paper by Ribeiro et al. 2018 reviewed several, um, several studies and compiled them all together and found that the known complications that are reported are lower limb ischemia, vessel injury, so dissection and rupture of the vessel either at the aorta or at the femoral uh, artery and then introduction of air and blood emboli, which can be catastrophic. So the largest study we have to date, um, we, we have no really RCTs of Reboa. We're not necessarily there yet, but we have systematic reviews of smaller studies. So case reports, case series, cohort studies. It was done by Borger van der Berg et al. Uh, it was published in 2018. There was 89 articles in there. 18 of them were specific to trauma. Other uses with Reboa were in things like um, postpartum hemorrhage, as well as triple A's. So 18 of these studies were in trauma. There was a high risk of bias, like I mentioned, because they were low quality studies. Uh, 14,000, sorry, 1,482 patients were reviewed. 
uh, 870 of them, so a good chunk of them were traumatic patients. Going specifically to the trauma population, their mortality rate was around 63%. So this is like a last ditch effort. This patient is, is gonna die, what else can we do sort of situation. Interestingly enough, again, take this with a grain of salt, but there was a slight increase, decrease in the mortality in the robo groups versus the other treatment groups when they compiled all those low quality studies together. There was also a very significant increase in the systolic blood pressure in the Rabo group, which is not surprising. I mean, you're occluding the aorta. There was a nearly 80 millimeters of mercury increase in systolic blood pressure. Uh, and complication rates were actually reported to be quite low. But again, there's lots of bias. There's going to be lots of good case reports published about, about Raboa, and probably they're not going to be publishing all the uh, complications uh, as openly. So there's less than 5%. What is the history of Rabot in Canada? It was only approved in 2017 as a result of all the hoopla. Uh, the first emergency department deployment that is reported in Canada was done at St. Mike's. Uh, I believe it was also by the paper that was, it was in CGEM. I think it was by Dr. Petrosoniak as well, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, it was in 2019, the indication they used it for was a MVC, which had a positive FAST. They actually use it in zone one. So in that, that um, non-invasive cross clamping sort of situation, they were able to deploy it in seven minutes from the decision to the occlusion of the aorta. They had significant improvement in the blood pressure and were able to bridge this patient to the OR. However, unfortunately, uh, this patient did not survive, first of all, and second of all, during the time they were in the OR, they lost pulses to the leg. They required take back to the OR for a pulseless leg as well. So, you know, they had a complication and, and I suspect probably there's higher complications than is reported so far in the literature. Here's the LHSC robot protocol talking to Dr. Leeper. Uh, it's mostly used for the zone three. So an unstable pelvic injury. And so going through this algorithm, basically, if you suspect that this patient is unstable, uh, from, a from a pelvic injury and they are not going to respond to all your interventions, put in a femoral arterial line catheter for as a femoral art line and page vascular surgery right away. Only vascular surgery can put these in. And obviously because of that, you'll probably get the junior. So ask for the staff. It'll probably be a delay to get the uh, Reboa kit down as well. So, you know, something we can talk about as far as integrating our systems like we talked about before. But uh, when they come down, they will upsize the femoral artery catheter and place the Reboa if indicated. As I was doing my research, interestingly enough, this popped up. So just last week or so, Dr. Power from vascular surgery here, here at LHSC, he invented a, the smallest Reboa kit that they have, hence the title of Size Matters. Uh, it's a four French and um, he just got Health Canada approval for it. So pretty interesting. Overall summary before we jump into questions and discussion. So we talked about transfusion ratios and the evidence behind them. Most people are doing one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one because of the signals. However, uh, really the studies so far with proper say that one-to-one-to-one, one-to-one-to-two, there's probably not significant differences, but uh, most protocols in most places will, will advocate one-to-one-to-one, -to -one. follow your local practice guidelines. We talked about TXA and the evidence behind it. Mortality benefit, absolutely give TXA, give it within three hours. Uh, we talked about Rotem and TAG. Currently, there's no recommendations for it. There's no difference in the studies that we can find, but it seems like it's the future. It's going to be coming. It's just a matter of time. We talked about Reboa. So um, consider it at LHSC in the unstable pelvis that is not responding to our interventions. We have to call vascular. So the most we can do is put in the, the art line. Uh, we talked about vasopressin, uh, certainly needs further studies, but it can be considered there was less blood product usage in the vasopressin group. So that's what we talked about, but bottom line, so what has mortality benefit that we can intervene on? So certainly give blood over crystalloids. I think that goes without saying it's standard practice. Give TXA. And the big thing that we could probably improve on that will have the most important benefit for our patients is changing our institutional protocols. So that study we talked about from UK, the code red, where they integrated everything, they had over 20% improvement. So my question is, there's lots of delays that I have seen in the last three years, like what can we improve? And I'll uh, end it there. Lots of references and I'll open it up to the group. Our friend, it's, uh, it's Ziad from um, 
transfusion medicine. Um, you did a fantastic job. That was that was superb. Um, I think you touched on uh, a lot of the highlights. Um, I did draw the attention of everybody to the the seven T's of trauma. One of them was temperature. Uh, that uh, you know, I'm sure you intended to talk about it, but uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of important T's that we, we didn't have time for today. The other big thing you said, you know, what can we improve, right? So we had two major issues in 2020 where um, um, blood was given to the wrong patient uh, in trauma. Um, and so these have been brought to the attention of, of the leadership in, in the emergency room and, um, you know, basically situations where there's two traumas at least and uh, either AB plasma or O blood is sent down to a specific one of them and it's swapped. And uh, this is a major kind of risk for harm. Um, you know, the blood bank doesn't always give you blood that's good for every single recipient. Sometimes we have information uh, historically in our lab system that means we can choose a specific unit for a specific recipient, even though they're, uh, they're you know, unknown to the eMERGE doc, they might be known to the blood bank. So we've had two situations. So just advice to everyone to make sure that the blood goes to the right patient. Uh, the blood bank is strategically situated next to eMERGE so that there's you know, less than a five minute delay in getting the blood. I think uh, one thing to uh, Earth, uh, great job there, man. There's a lot of uh, dense material to unpackage there. And I thought you did an excellent job of signposting for everyone to dig deeper into various things. From a QI perspective, one thing that we're noticing as frontline providers is that five minutes can take some time, especially with penetrating trauma. Um, Petrosiak and his group in Toronto actually did a study on how the people are navigating to get to and from blood bank. And they were able to shave two minutes off um, the timelines it takes to get blood into the recess room. So part and part, I, I think one big contributor to some of those issues that you pointed out, um, Dr. Sol, or the duration of time it takes to get that blood to the emergency room uh, is sometimes too long. So if there's any possibility or efforts in place to get blood actually physically in the trauma bay, that would mitigate a lot of these issues that have come up, as you pointed out. Yeah, certainly um, it was, we, we used to have um, that as, a, as, a, as an option. And I think uh, there were concerns about how the blood was utilized and, um, and um, accessed. Is there any other questions? I know the Royal College guys have to write their exam. I think there's some interesting systems issues we can definitely talk about. Um, I think one, as, as just a standard statement, we absolutely need to improve our pre-hospital communication. And this goes for both land and air providers. Um, there's kind of really no reason almost ever, unless a trauma is happening blocks away from Vic Hospital, um, where a report shouldn't be sent in to the charge team uh, at or th through the patch phone with kind of a full report with a full set of vital signs and especially with orange too. Um, and I think those that often unfortunately doesn't happen and that that's some low hanging fruit that we can absolutely uh, address to help improve team preparedness to know if a patient's had significant pre hospital hypotension we know that's a predictor of increased mortality and blood requirements and trauma I think that would be really helpful information and we're we're working with that on on the air side i don't have uh much control on the land side but that's something that we're working on and then i think another thing to maybe consider and this is a, maybe a bit more topical because now we we are registering a lot more people as unknowns is i think the 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 efficiency that would be increased in our seen trauma patients where we don't have ID in pre-registering those individuals so that uh, things like lab and x-ray are ready when those patients arrive and things can happen immediately and you're not waiting for a health card to be registered and a patient pin to be created. And then eventually those charts can be merged once you know proper identification is found. I think that's another potential time savings that we could improve on. Um, just as a, as a general thought, I know we don't want more people registered as unknowns, but in the, in the sick, uh, bleeding or shocky trauma patient in general, um, I think there would, there'd absolutely be immense value there. 
Um, and then, yeah, it's an interesting point. I'm really glad Kelly could could join this morning, uh, Dr. Vote. And I think um, it, it's and, and this is an issue in, in any emergency system, whether it be uh, a trauma team waiting for a patient, a surgical team, um, a, a pre-hospital HEMS team is the issue of over and under triage. And I think that's a very institution, that's a very institution dependent uh, variable, right? Um, I think over triage does create a tendency for people to become lax in protocol and that basically defeats that which you're trying to improve on, right? But I think there probably is a little bit of a better balance we could achieve here um, between over and under triage. I just, I don't have the, the proper historical perspectives that, you know, some other people on this call may, and, you know, I've only been staff here for about seven years now. Um, but yeah, it's uh, interesting food for thought. Or find just one uh, other comments, John Dreyer. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. And actually, this is a presentation that we should get out to all our referring hospitals because uh, um, they're certainly not necessarily following uh, the type of you know protocol that that uh, you're recommending and that is now kind of should be the standard. Uh, so I'd certainly urge the trauma office and Kelly can probably look after this to actually get this out to uh, uh, to the chiefs of staff in the in the smaller community hospitals. This is fantastic. Yeah, Earth, it's Kelly. If you send your presentation to me, I'll have it sent out to our regional trauma network. And then everybody should get it. <laughs> it was a great job. And and in in response to Samir's comments and my others, I mean, I I think we all want a system where the person who ends up needing all the blood and the then the quick operation would have all the right people called the moment we know about them. The struggle is identifying that. Um, I like your concept of if we're activating massive transfusion, maybe we can uh, call all those people. Although I will say that we activate massive transfusion about four times as often as we actually massively transfuse people in trauma. Mm. So for every four activations, only one person is actually getting a massive transfusion. At least when we look at it kind of retrospectively, it's really hard the way we do it to identify those people ahead of time. And we've built that into the system on purpose because we're never going to have, you know, blood sitting, waiting for us in the emergency department. So calling for blood for patients before they arrive and activating massive transfusion in hopes that we don't need it, but we might need it, um, is, is always going to be the way, at least for the foreseeable future here in London. And just to add to that, I mean, uh, the, the, from the blood bank perspective, that is okay. We, we'd, we'd rather have overactivation than, than underactivation. Um, if the physician finds that hmm, maybe this is not a massive hemorrhage um, and they just want to you know, have blood available, there's always the option to call and say, can I have four units of red cells? Um, just as what we call kind of a, a speed bump. Uh, so you don't get the rush of all the blood products and everything. Um, so for sure, Kelly, I, I think overactivation is something that happens, but from um, getting resources quickly perspective for the blood bank, which also means, you know, we have to call in technologists sometimes to the blood bank uh, overnight. Uh, we'd rather be alerted in advance than alerted, you know, 10 minutes after the patient uh, arrived. <laughs> yeah. And Dr. Sol, thanks for joining this call too. I think, is there another is there potentially a role for a small uh, change in our massive transfusion protocols to integrate calcium as well? Um, I know MTPs in other kinds, of, like I know in the, in the UK, I can speak for as I worked there, that it was a standard practice when we were initiating a massive transfusion to have a bolus of calcium actually given so, so some guidelines recommended with the first dose of blood somewhere every three or four units. It's definitely underutilized here. I can probably count the number of times I've seen calcium given in this situation prophylactically. Um, I don't know what our current rates of hypocalcemia are in these patients. I imagine it's gonna mirror other experiences and there's no reason that we'd be any different. Uh, do you think there's any, any need to either have a, a regular dosage of calcium in our MTPs or create yeah. some sort of reminder in our- uh, Yes, well, 100%, 100, we're actually in the process of, um, so, you know, we're changing the name of the protocol from massive transfusion protocol to massive hemorrhage protocol. Awesome. Because when, it, when it's massive transfusion, you're asking for blood. 
when it's massive hemorrhage control, it's where's the calcium? What's the temperature of the patient? What's, you know, language uh, matters. <laughs> language matters. Um, so we're definitely trying to incorporate that. We've also just um, started, um, we've almost finished working on the pediatric massive hemorrhage protocol, which, which will also be um, massive, massive hemorrhage, uh, you know, with, with calcium and all the other tidbits like tranexamic acid, which is not a blood product. Um, so th definitely we're, we're on the, on the same page. Um, and, um, you know, in April, there's going to be a provincial massive hemorrhage uh, protocol uh, rolled out. I'm sure a lot of you are, are aware and London's going to be definitely part of that. And, um, it will also be, um, looking at all the other non blood, uh, adjuvants that are essential for, for hemorrhage control. And for all the emergency providers on this, on this phone call, please, please, please remember your calcium when you are giving blood products to somebody. Um, at the very least, we should be giving uh, a bolus of calcium every four units, if not more often. Um, but uh, please, please, please do not forget about calcium when you're uh, instituting a, a blood transfusion for somebody. Thanks, Irf. Nice job, Irf. Is Irf there? 